How many of you like watching movies? And what would be your favorite kind of movie, uh, uh, action uh, films or sci-fi? How many of you like love stories? Yeah, you know, I, I hate to admit it. I, I do like to watch, and two of my favorite movies, especially during the Christmas holidays, uh, one is You've Got Mail. Anybody watch that one? You've Got Mail. Sleepless in Seattle. That's what I watch uh, a, lot, a lot of times. I hate to admit it, but I, I, I certainly do. And, and, and so uh, love stories are quite, quite the thing. They stir up all kinds of things. Well, we're going to start a new book. The book of Ruth. And one of the exciting things about our church is that we study the word of God. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Ruth. If you're anywhere in the New Testament, you're off. Get into the Old Testament and and you'll find it. It's going to take a little bit to do that. So this this book of Ruth is an incredible love story. It'll be like this Hallmark movie. Uh, I'm telling you who would not be in this movie. Stallone, <laughs> Liam Nielsen, they're not going to be in there. This doesn't have car chases, doesn't have fight scenes, nothing is exploding. What we have is two women and a lot of talking. <laughs> Just saying that, but good stuff. This guy, but here's the thing about this book. There's so much to learn in it. So this summer... There's four chapters. We're probably going to do four messages out of this book. So we're going to look at this idea and this first message about God being a turnaround God. So if you're in a place in your life where you need to make a change, or if you're somewhere and you need to make a move, you're in the right service today. You know, God is amazing that many times he brings about a necessary end to birth something brand new in your life. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That something literally died. It had to end so that you could experience something brand new. Well, Ruth chapter 1. Verses uh, 1 to 19, we're going to look at today. You know, this is such an incredible book. It's, it's, a, it's really a transitional book. Uh, uh, it, it, it comes right after the book of, of Judges, and then it, it, it transitions us into First and Second Kings. So if you haven't found it yet, find those two books, look in between, and you'll, you'll, you'll find it. Ruth chapter uh, 1, verses 1 to 5. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, we'll come back to that. There was a famine. We'll come back to that in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Moab. The man's name was Emelech. His wife was Naomi. And there, the names of their two sons was Malion and Kilion. Malion, his name, it means uh, sick or sickly. Kilion, it means frail or tired. So sick and tired. How many of you said I would describe your kids on a Monday morning trying to get them to school? <laughs> Says there were Ephrodites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Amalek, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth, after they had lived there about 10 years. Both Malion and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left with her two, was left without her two sons and her husband. So let's back up a little bit on this passage. So he says that it took place during the time of the judges. So it was a time where there were no kings in Israel. That was about 400 years 
of being absolutely lost as a nation. There was a lot of anarchy at that time and a great verse, in fact, this incredible verse, it sums up, it's the final verse in the book of Judges. This is what it says. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the more they did what they want, the more they became unhappy. The result of this anarchy, this result of them pulling away from God, doing whatever they want, there was a famine. You know, the children of Israel, they were in the promised land. It was supposed to be this place that was flowing with milk and honey. This family was from Bethlehem. The name Bethlehem means what? House of bread. That this famine was in the place of provision. Why? This famine was a result of their sin and their rebellion against God. It was also God's way of drawing his people back to him. While this is going on, Emelech makes this decision to move to Moab. Now you need to understand how disastrous that decision was for him. The reality is sometimes in life, desperate times leads us to make probably not the wisest decisions. Moab was only about 30, maybe 40 miles away from Bethlehem, but they had their own religion. In fact, they didn't worship the God of the Bible. They worshiped this demonic God, Hemos. And uh, they practiced a lot of sexual sin, and the entire race came from, if you remember the name Lot. Lot impregnated one of his daughters, this insensuous relationship, and this nation came from them. They were a a, a people that practiced a lot of um, sexual sin and perversion as part of their lifestyle, and there was a lot of child sacrifices in that religion. The Israelites really were instructed not to intermarry with them. Now, when you read the text, there's this inference in the text that really uh, Amalek wasn't planning on going there for a long time. If you have some of the older versions, the word is sojourn. It means they were going there, but they were planning on coming back. But he's there now 10 years. It's really a picture of how sin works, that many times it keeps you a lot longer than you were planning for that to have this hold on you. Amalek, his name means God is king. But he really, in this moment, he is acting like he is the king. His wife is Naomi, and after 10 years, in a place where they should have never been, her husband dies, and she loses her two sons. She's left with their wives who are Moabite women, this is not a great start to the love story. But how many of you know it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And God is a God that finishes our life well. Verse six to nine, when Naomi heard in Moab, That's what she heard. In the place of absolute pain, she hears that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. She and her daughter-in-laws prepared to return home from there. With with her two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-laws, go back to each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant 
that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So after 10 years, and all this has happened, we read that she hears. You know, it's amazing to me where God can get your attention. You know, Jonah, he's in the belly of a large fish, and God gets his attention. This is an incredible story of Elijah. He's in a cave, and there's an earthquake, and there's a fire, and it says that he hears the still, small voice of God. Uh, Saul, in the book of Acts, he is going and he's persecuting the Christians, passionately doing it. And on the road to Damascus, God gets a hold of him. What I'm saying to you is, like sometimes we tell people, you have to get out of your situation. You have to make a change. And then, how many of you are glad that you didn't have to do anything? God spoke to you right where you were at. He got your attention in the darkest place, in the lowest hour of your life. He got a hold of you and he spoke a word of hope. Look at verse 12 and 13. Return her, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if, and even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then give birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? So that was the custom, the tradition. That if your husband died, and the family would provide another son uh, for you. Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. I wonder this morning if you could relate to where Naomi is at. See, if we're not careful in the midst of our struggle and our heartbreak, life can make you bitter. So in the story, what we have now is we have a widow. We have widows with no hope, no money. And finally, Naomi, the mother, decides it's time to return to Bethlehem. Along the way, they have this conversation, and she keeps telling them, you need to go back. Don't come with me. You need to go back. You need to go back. You're young. You're beautiful. Go back to your parents' home. You can find another husband who you can have sons. And Norpa says, okay, I'll go back. And then we have Ruth speaking for the first time in her story. Let's pick it up in verse 16. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. If this sounds familiar, maybe you were at a wedding. This is read a lot at the wedding, at weddings. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, and some of the versions said that she held on to her. Let me ask you, what, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on to? When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. Oh, Ruth, she declares this incredible determined loyalty to her mother-in-law. And then the most important part of that verse 
is she clear, declares her dependence on God. And she says this, they say, your people will be my people. And then she says this, and your God will be my God. She's saying, no longer I'm going to worship that demonic Hemos. I'm not going to worship him anymore. I'm going to worship the God of Israel. This is really her declaration of salvation. And that's what this book is really all about. It's this this beautiful story that helps us to to understand our story of being redeemed by Jesus. And, And we begin to see it happening in her life here. In Romans chapter 10, she declares it. Listen to what Romans chapter 10 says. That if we confess with our mouth, it's this declaration that the, that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved. That's what she's doing. She's declaring who her new God is. So they make the decision. We're leaving Moab. We're going to return to Bethlehem. To return to Bethlehem meant that they had to turn their back on Moab. And they had to look to Bethlehem. It's really a picture of repentance. Repentance is not just being sorry about something. Repentance is making a change. It it, it is turning your life away from something and turning it to something. You know, to get to the right place, you need to leave the wrong place. That's what this story is all about. And so like Ruth and Naomi, I wonder if you need to walk away from somewhere or someone or maybe you were in a place you should have never been there before to get to where you were meant to be. You know, I, I don't know about your life, but I'll talk about my life uh, here for a moment. Uh, I'm here today because I had to painfully leave something to come to a place where I could walk in what God has for me. That shouldn't be strange for any of us that sometimes you have to walk away, experience an ending of something and it might even be painful to walk into something brand new. Now that decision for Ruth to move from Moab to Bethlehem was not an easy decision. The Jews were forbidden to marry the Moabites. So there was a good chance that that she would remain childless and she would be living as a widow in a foreign land. How many of you found that making the right decisions is seldom an easy thing to do? But like I said, it is the thing that brings about the most powerful change in our life. Now this one decision, this one act, what I would refer to as repentance, this one choice to change her life, uh, gave her a brand new legacy. It even changed the entire world. It did. How many of you ever heard of Bethlehem before? House of Bread. Who was born in Bethlehem? Say it out loud. Jesus. Jesus. You know, last night we were in a Nigerian uh, service uh, uh, that we had from people from our church, and uh, uh, they were a lot livelier than you are this morning. <laughs> Say that name with me. Shout it out. Jesus. 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 That's who was born there. He is the bread of life. I don't want to give away this story. But Jesus is a descendant of Ruth. This is how amazing God is. That this woman who worshipped this false demonic God, who had this painful part of her life, who connected to another lady who was absolutely so painful, Naomi, who was in a place where she should have never ever been. These two connections, this choice to come back, to turn away from the old and to embrace something brand new, gave them this incredible legacy that Ruth 
is named in the lineage of Jesus. There is 41 generations from David to Jesus, 41. So let's back up a few more, okay? David's son was Jesse. Jesse's father was Obed. And Obed was the son of Ruth who meets a man by the name of Boaz. I don't want to give the story away. You got to come next week <laughs> to hear it. Bring somebody with you. Out of that toxic, broken relationship, God brought. This incredible story. But they had to walk away. So I'm wondering, what do you need to walk away from? What do you need to have the courage to change? That's what I'm praying. I'm praying that this summer, you know, summer for a lot of people is just, I just, I just going to... Exhale, nothing's going to change in my life. I, I, I just want to sit, take in the sun. I'm praying that God's going to stir your life. I'm praying he's going to stir my life. He's going to stir this church. I, I don't know about you. I'm not planning just to have reruns this summer. I want to bring you the word of God with such power. and anointing. I want our worship to come alive. I want this place to be electric with the presence of God. I don't know about you. If we ever need a move move of God, a revival, a rewakening of God's people. It is in this day and age. So I want you to come to the house of God because I believe that this is a season to put some things to rest and to embrace something brand new that God has for us. You know, interestingly, in the book of Ruth, it is one of maybe two books where you don't see any over to outward miracles. There, there's no parting of the Red Sea. There's no healing of the sick. There's no raising of the dead. But in every verse, if you look at this, ver this, this story, in every verse and in every chapter, you begin to see this powerful presence and providence of God. That he's working behind the scenes, preparing the way for them and really preparing the way for us. As chapter one closes, Ruth and Naomi arrive in Bethlehem. When they get there, they stir the whole town. The women in the town, they recognize her. It says, can this be Naomi? But Naomi carrying the pain of loss and brokenness and being away from her family and her, her God. She says, don't call me. Naomi, call me Mara. Her name means pleasant. She said, don't call me pleasant. Mara, Mara means bitter. The Almighty has made my life bitter. You know, oftentimes, when you look at life, sometimes life we look at it through a spectrum like it's the back side of a tapestry. I have a picture of the back side of a tapestry. And many times our life to us and even to other people, it looks this way. There's just random threads. There's knots. It looks a mess. Maybe here today, you're at home. And that's what you see. And when you look in the mirror, you see the mess. But 
how many of you know that life was never meant for us to see the back side of it? It's the front side of it. This is a picture of a crown. It's a crown. See, God is this master weaver. At the back, it looks like these are random things. You, you just met this person. You, you just made this move. This, this unfortunate thing happened to you in your life. And you didn't know what to do. But really, it wasn't by chance. There was a greater purpose playing out. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, a verse, a verse that we quote all the time. What does it say? All things, they work together for the good of those who love the Lord, who have been called according to his purpose. So as we embrace this incredible book on this journey together, at the very outset, there's hope. Like Naomi, you would hear in your pain, there's provision. In the place where you should always have been. And there's this new life and this new opportunity that he's preparing for you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, in this room, online, there are people who are looking at the backside and seeing the mess. Help us to see the right side, the front side. The reality that you are working behind the scenes. You are making the way where we can't even see the way. That you are opening doors. And you are creating opportunities. And you are changing hearts. And you are working behind the scenes providentially and to bring us to the place where you intended us to be. So I pray for courage. I come against every lie of the enemy. We bind his lies over our life. Speak faith to well up and help us as parents as we pray for our children and that we will get a glimpse of the right side of what you're doing behind the scenes. Today, we thank you. We thank you for the incredible work of Joe's Place and the opportunity to partner with them. We thank you for the work that, as a congregation, we do here and right across this great nation. Today, we partner with you in the work that you do behind the scenes to make such incredible changes. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Love you very much.